Hello, hello. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Veggies Abroad Vegan Travel Podcast with the chief veggie pusher, myself, Rebecca Gady Sawicki. Some of you may already be familiar with Veggies Abroad, but for those of you who aren't, we're a full service vegan travel company that offers custom planning services, small group trips, and even a helpful blog chock full of just about everything a vegan or veg curious traveler could possibly need to plan an adventure. And I've recently added this podcast to the mix. With this podcast, I hope to bring you guys the inside scoop of what vegan, vegan friendly, and eco friendly businesses are doing in the wide world of travel. Plus, I'll give you the full download of what's going on behind the scenes at Veggies Abroad. All right, so this podcast has been rolling for almost a couple of weeks-ish, and I was anxious to see which episode has been the most popular. It was surprising to me, and it might be surprising to you too. I was assuming that most of you are tuning in for Travel Insight, but there also might be a good number of you who are on the veggie fence because the most popular episode thus far has been, I could never go vegan with my other half, Matt. Many of you have even sent emails sharing how much that episode resonated with you, which is awesome. But it leads me to the question, are there a lot of you tuning in that would like more how do I conquer this vegan type thing content? If so, be sure to shoot me an email and I will add those types of topics into the queue for future episodes. In addition to that, let's see, it's travel and tour planning season over here. It seems that many of you have kicked off the year looking for help with trips or have questions about one of our upcoming small group vegan tours, which is also terrific. And if you're thinking, wait a second, you have small group trips? Yeah, we sure do. Last year, we ventured to Thailand, and this year, we will be venturing to East Africa, Bali, and Costa Rica. And guess what? You are invited. Now, you might be thinking, oh, small groups aren't for me. You know what? For years, I thought that too. And then I went on one to Iceland, and it was honestly one of my favorite trips, I mean, Iceland is really a remarkable country, but when you get to do it with some really fabulous people, it makes it all even better. I would not have had the same experience visiting the country if I hadn't have had that group experience. And not only do you get the opportunity to experience more than what you might've done on your own, with my trips, you get to travel with like-minded folks and make new friends. Who couldn't use more friends? Am I right? And if you don't believe me, listen to this review from one of our Thailand travelers. Best trip I've ever done. Every detail was considered. The food was incredible. And I did slash saw way more than if I had tried to plan this trip on my own. I'll definitely be traveling with veggies abroad again and again. Thank you so much for that. That really means a lot. Uh, This also segues very nicely into today's topic. I am taking you behind the scenes of what it's like to run small group vegan trips with an all-star planner, Kim Giovacco from Veg Jaunts and Journeys. Kim has been an asset to me as I ventured into the wide world of vegan travel. I remember when I first started with just a blog, I would read about what some of these other companies were doing and think, oh my God, it's all amazing. I don't Think that I can accomplish that. When you're starting out, it can be a little intimidating, to be honest. And I would reach out to other people to try and make connections. And it wasn't always as easy as you might expect it would be. But Kim was one of the standout people who would go above and beyond to be supportive. I am honestly really thankful that our paths crossed. Kim Giovacco founded Veg Johnson Journeys in 2016. Veg Johnson Journeys provides small group tours internationally for vegans and veg curious travelers. Since 2017, Kim has run 35 tours in Europe and the U.S. with a large percentage of repeat customers. Prior to starting Veg Johnson Journeys, Kim worked in different areas of the travel industry and spent nearly two decades working for a branch office of Singapore's Economic Development Board, where she perfected the skill of attention to detail required for organizing tours. In addition to vegan international tours, Kim works with her chef partner, Mark Cirkvenik, to provide whole food plant-based no-oil tours in locations near national parks, where eating a healthy plant-based diet can be a challenge. So with that, let's get Kim on here. Hi, Kim. Thank you. 
thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here, Rebecca. So to kick things off, if you can share with our listeners a little bit of, of an overview about Veg Johnson Journeys and also what inspired you to start the company. Well, we started in 2017 with one tour. And um, up until now, we've run 35 tours um, in Europe and the US. And this is the first year that we will be expanding to Africa and to Asia. And um, well, I always traveled on my own. I had never even taken a group tour uh, because I was vegetarian all those years. And most of the tours I looked at exploited animals in some way um, in certain activities. And I didn't want to be with a group and they would say, well, here's the vegetarian entree. You don't have any choice and it wasn't going to be interesting. So um I just decided um, six or seven years ago that I would start something that I really didn't think existed out there. And um, after I did start the company, I saw that there were a couple other um, vegan tour companies, but we were kind of all doing things a little bit differently. And um, I thought there was room for another one. So um, we had obviously two years of no tours during the pandemic, but we had a fabulous uh, year last year and we're also on track to have a really good year this year, um, adding more tours every year. And I even now have three people that are helping me lead tours. So it's grown a lot. That's really amazing. Congratulations to you. Like my hat really goes off to you for that kind of growth. Um, that's, that is remarkable. And you started off just doing everything on your own too, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I always had a nine to five job, which I was very happy with. And, um, the first year that I started the business, um, really it was on a part-time basis and I, definitely recommend that as the way to go. So I still had a corporate salary and I was just doing the tours on the side. I had four weeks vacation and I thought, oh, I'll just lead tours during my vacation time and that it would just be a part-time gig. And then, um, it was just very strange the way it happened. Um, I had been at my previous position for almost 20 years and um, then they uh, decided to close the office where I was in Boston and wanted me to move to New York. And I really didn't want to do that at that point in my life. I was already 50. And so I decided to leave. And I was uh, so fortunate to be given um, a large severance package uh, after being there for so long. And Basically, that allowed me to, um, you know, have the funds to live on for a few years while I was getting the business started. And that's the way it worked out. So it kind of just went from a part time possibility to full time. And I was so excited every day. I was working like 70 hours a week, <laughs> just jumping out of bed uh, with a whole list of things to do, working until 11 o'clock at night. And, um, I, I really didn't mind it at all. And um, luckily now, yeah, I don't have to work so many hours. I mean, there's still a lot to do, but um, I don't feel it's as crazy as it was um, when I first started. That is really nice. That gives me a little bit of hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am still very much in the, it is crazy <laughs> time of my life. I haven't my boat hasn't made it to the smooth sailing part of the journey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it always takes a few years. I, I can see that with other companies as well, yeah. you know, so you will definitely get there. And I, I know you will with, because your skills are so fabulous and you're so creative. You're very, 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 very kind. <laughs> Do you think that you would have made this transition if the changes in your previous career hadn't happened? Do you think you would have still uh, kept no it part time? Oh. Wow, interesting. <laughs> no, because I'm not even like a risk taker. I I never even thought I would want to be my own boss. Yeah. You know, I I was very comfortable with my with my job and my benefits, and um, 
never even considered being my own boss. But now that is the thing that is the most important thing to me, being able to set my own schedule. And just um, when I lived in Boston, I had awful commutes. I, I literally commuted at two hours each way to get to work. And now to be able to um, just work from home in an area where lots and lots of people come for vacation every year, it's like a different life. And I would really have a hard time giving that up. I mean, I love just... Uh, if there's some vegan event happening on a Wednesday at noon, I can just go mm -hmm. and I don't have to ask anybody, you know, and if I have to work at night or on the weekend or something, that's fine with me. My gosh, that's really interesting. So it was kind of like a blessing in disguise that it worked mm -hmm. out. Although I'm going to guess it probably didn't feel like a blessing in disguise in the beginning. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was, um, there was a lot of stress, definitely, especially, um, well, because at the beginning of 2020, I had, I think, eight or nine tours scheduled that year. Many of them were sold out. And then obviously everyone had to be canceled. And then 2021, I had, I think, 10 tours planned and only one happened uh, in the fall of 21. So I will say I lost a lot of motivation during COVID uh, just because, you know, I did so much work with the planning and then a lot of the tours never happened. Okay, yes, yeah, some of them got... Um, postponed to 2022, but there are still some that, yeah, itineraries that I kind of have ready to go, but we just haven't rescheduled them yet. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so thankful for the way things turned around. Yeah, for sure. In the beginning, were there points when you thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. I got to hang up my hat and find something else to do. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I felt like I had put so much time and money into the business, so it it felt really like it would be a waste to let it go. Mm -hmm. But I was always thinking to myself, oh, I'd, I'd be very happy just getting a job at the food co-op or something <laughs> like during COVID. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just like working in this very, you know, easygoing environment. And, and then I even thought about putting my application in sometimes. And then I'd be like, oh yeah, they open at seven o'clock in the morning. No, I don't really see this <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily it never had to come to that. <laughs> I mean, that is good for sure. Were there things that surprised you about planning tours, uh, about working within the travel space when you first started? Um, I think, as you know, there's just lots of kind of back-end things that need to be set up with insurance and licenses, and I never really thought about those things at the beginning. But now that everything is set up, it's a great feeling, and most things just need to be renewed every year. And um, yeah, I always felt like I wasn't very good at marketing, and mm -hmm. I'd have like a list of all these things that I felt that I should be doing. But, you know, I have to say that the past few years, the tours have almost been selling themselves. I don't even really do that much with social media. Uh, luckily, you know, the tours are easily found on Google. I mean, even though I have a good number of people on my mailing list, um, the majority of the time when on the registration form, when it says, where did you hear about the tour? Uh, the guest says Google search. Mm -hmm. So it's either that. And I have thankfully a ton of repeat clients. So that's what really keeps me going was that like at the end of 2023, so many people were already asking, well, what do you have on tap for 2025? And yeah. that had never really happened before where they were looking ahead already. And that just made me feel so good. And um, yeah, just the fact that they're waiting to see the, the new tour lineup, it just makes it a lot easier to get up and go to work every day. Oh my God, yeah. It's like you've scaled a mountain 
Mm. From yeah. the, like physically <laughs> and figuratively. Because the first part of that mountain, like it sucks. You get to the middle of the mountain, it still sucks. And then you yep. kind of yep. get to the top and you're like, oh my God. All right. There is relief. It's not like constantly straight up all of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, of course, well, a lot of my guests have never been to Europe before. So they want to obviously go to all the blockbuster places. And so there's certain tours that we do every year, which would be uh, Portugal and Italy, uh, Rome, Florence, Venice. And those two always sell out. And um, the other ones are either new or offered every other year. Mm -hmm. So there is still a lot of new planning um, for sure. And um, I really never thought that I would have more than 10 tours a year, but we're on schedule to have probably 15 or 16 next year. But that's because I now have um, helped people helping me lead the tours. And I even have an assistant who uh, helps me with admin work about 10 hours a week. So uh, yeah, other than that, I, I was pretty much once I got to 10 tours, I could not handle it all on my own anymore. Yeah. I can't imagine that all on one person. That's a lot. That's a lot of travel. Because when you think oh, like everything. each, um, each tour probably has 75 to 100 reservations yeah. when you add up like the hotel reservations, the activities, the transfers, um, what else? The restaurant reservations. Yeah, it's really a lot, a really, really a lot to keep track yeah. of. Then so the many special details. requests and keeping those um, in mm-hmm. line. Yeah, it is definitely, it's a lot on one person. Um, yeah. Uh, kudos to you once again. <laughs> what were you. some of the challenges that are challenging things that you had to navigate in the very beginning that you thought like, oh my God, I wasn't prepared for this, especially with the transition of going from like having a, um, a full-time job to now being your own boss, which was completely new space. Um, well, luckily I'm a very organized person, but, um, I think just keeping emails organized and just streamlining processes and a lot of things did take me a few years. And I would say, I only feel comfortable right now Mm -hmm. that I'm not wasting a lot of time. Um, and I, I don't really have things automated. I know that I could more, but I do like to have kind of individual one-on-one correspondence with the people going on the tours. And just so I know who they are, especially since I'm not leading all of the tours now. So, um, yeah, I don't have automated responses for anything. I just, you know, answer all the emails right when they come in pretty much. People are always remarking, um, about how quickly I get back to them. And, um, you know, that makes me feel really good. And, um, yeah, so I think just coming up with processes and I, I didn't really have anything to follow. I mean, I will say that the job that I had previously for 18 years, um, that was actually working for the government of Singapore. It was a branch office in, in Boston. And, um, one of the main parts of our job was, um, organizing the travel for, Singapore's high level government officials that were coming to the Boston area to meet with corporations and pharmaceutical companies and Harvard and MIT. And so that was really a lot of detailed work. And uh, we had this whole in house program called a trip planner. And that helped me so much with my business. I, I couldn't believe how the skills uh, transferred over. And, um, and yeah, was just really happy that I had been working with that level of detail, um, for all those years. So, and then too, like finding the right kind of platform 
to use for a tour operator business. So I was using one for a few years and it was good, but I felt like I still needed a lot of other programs to go along with it. But the one I have now includes so many things and I'm not even using it to its capacity. I mean, it could do accounting and bookkeeping and things like that. I'm still using something separate for that. But Um, you know, it can keep, it's like a CRM. It can keep track of all the customers. It's, um, an itinerary planner. Um, and, uh, yeah, but you know, things like that, it, it takes a while to find them. I'm definitely in a lot of Facebook groups Mm -hmm. for, for tour operators and for travel agents just to see what they're using and to get suggestions and, yeah, there is like an endless amount of things that you can do. And some people are like, this is going to make your life easier. This will make your life easier. And you're <laughs> like, okay, what's going to make my life the easiest? And then what's the price tag? Because that's always yeah. the thing that follows with it too. Because everyone's like, that's something. And they're like, oh, that's $1,000. That's another $1,000. And I'm like, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I like the one that I'm using now, but it definitely had a big learning curve and they themselves were a new company. So they were working out kinks and I learned how to use it during COVID, but then it probably wasn't for another year until a tour actually ran. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. Now I did all these training courses a year ago. I don't remember how any of this works yeah. now, you know, and I had to keep asking them for help, but, um, everything is good now. Yeah. So yeah. Technology is great <laughs> when it works. Do you, yeah. <laughs> do you think it's harder to plan a non-vegan trip versus a vegan trip? Especially looking back to your time, uh, your previous career with having to plan itineraries for people, do you think one's easier than the other? Um, I feel like I couldn't plan a non-vegan one now <laughs> because that's a great I think, answer. <laughs> as you know, in a way, being vegan and traveling is a little more difficult. Sure, but it also it it has it just gives you such focus and you have then like a theme and, you know, I pretty much will, um, only make reservations at vegan restaurants if they're available. Um, and if they're good, you know, I mean, yeah, there's something to be said for vegan options at non-vegan places. I mean, sometimes they're terrific, but during the tours, I definitely like to try to support the vegan businesses. And, um, I feel like now if I was just eating at any restaurant, I would be so overwhelmed with the choices. I mean, I, I don't like to have a lot of choices. So (laughs) I like to kind of have this narrow scope. It makes it so much easier, but as you know, in some cities, I I mean, there's, there's so many choices. You still have to really narrow it down. Um, But just like even for the itinerary, you know, to say like, oh, well, this city has all these vegan activities and we want to try to fit them all in on on the itinerary and then, you know, just add in some mainstream attractions and things. And yeah, so I think the kind of the limiting choices can actually make it a lot easier. And um yeah, if if somebody were to, you know, I I don't have time anymore to uh, help people plan private vacations, mm-hmm. which which I had been doing up until last year, but I kind of would just be at a loss. I, I wouldn't know where to tell people where to eat yeah. and things like that. Yeah, I've had uh, <laughs> ple- people ask me like, so do you only do the vegan trips? And I was like, yeah, I only plan the vegan ones. And they're like, but would you do just a regular trip? I was like, what do you mean by this regular trip? And I go, are you telling me, do you want me to make your reservation at a steakhouse? I will not do your reservation at a steakhouse, but will I take yep. care of your hotels and other stuff? Like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. But I'm probably going to prioritize ones that are vegan friendly and sustainable yeah. and all those other things. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think it just makes it so much more interesting. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes these places also have some kind of a story with them as well. And, um, 
they're also trying to do other things within the community. And it's just like Mm -hmm. such a nice feeling to be able to be like, okay, we're going to give you money because you have to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. I think yeah. that makes it. There's different. nothing sadder than when some place you've been going to for a few years, you learn that it closes, you know, and I don't know, it's a little scary right now because, you know, there were like some completely vegan grocery stores yeah. in Berlin and now they've closed and we don't know why they closed. I mean, in some ways, it could be a good thing because vegan veganism is becoming more mainstream now, but Mm -hmm. it's really sad to not be able to go to those places. We always included a stop there on our tours. And that is a complete bummer. I actually was looking at the one in Iceland and Reykjavik it's temporarily closed right now. And I was like, Oh no, no. I hate temporarily closed. I feel like that's just the gateway to completely closed. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. I know. It's such a bummer. So yeah. this moves into a very good segue into your itineraries. When you're building them, do you always focus on a specific destination or specific activities or is it or a certain partner or is it kind of a mix of everything? How do you determine like where you're going to go and what you're going to do? Well, I would say in Europe where as of now, I only have tours that go to vegan friendly destinations. Um, and I feel that there's still a lot we haven't gone to yet. And I would really love to be doing tours to more off the beaten path places that I've been to, but I'm not confident that I could sell out a tour there, uh, at this point, maybe in a few years. Mm -hmm. So, um, in Europe, it's vegan-friendly places. Um, then sometimes I have vegan partners approach me and ask me to bring a tour to where they are. So again, it, it depends on if I think I can sell a tour there. Sometimes there's good places, but they'll just kind of be like in the countryside, and I just don't think I can I can fill a group. Um, we have a tour. We actually have two tours this year because the first one sold out so quickly um, for a safari in Namibia, which um, is not a vegan friendly place. Mm-hmm. But I'm working there with um, a vegan guide and um, his there. It's a tour operator, um, husband and wife, and he's basically the guide and she is a certified plant-based cook. So when we go to, um, the safari lodges, if they don't have vegan options, this couple will, uh, bring all the food and, and cook outside, uh, which is a very popular thing to do in Namibia. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that was, an instance where they approached me. I mean, I never would have thought about doing a tour there and I thought it looked great. And, uh, the first tour sold out in 48 hours. And then we (laughs) added another one for a few months later. And that one is sold out now too. So, um, and then I never thought I would be doing tours in the U S. Um, I always kind of thought, yeah, you don't really need a tour in the U.S. You know, most people should be able to do that on their own. Yeah. But um, a few years ago, I started having people asking for whole food, plant-based, no oil tours. And um, that concept is still pretty much unheard of in Europe, especially places like Greece and Spain mm-hmm. and Italy, where it's so like much oil olive oil is used. Capitals. Yeah. So... I had the idea, I mean, I'm not much of a cook and I certainly could not cook for a big group, but I had the idea that, um, if I brought a chef along that it could be possible and we wouldn't, um, eat in any restaurants because you can't really eat in restaurants if you're following that Mm -hmm. way of eating. Um, so my chef, Well, we met online during COVID. I took a class from him, a five-week class. And at the end of the class, I uh, learned that he and his wife really love to travel. And he had recently been certified by um, 
uh, PCRM. And so he's a food for life instructor and chef. And um, he's kind of in his retirement career or his second career. And his name is Mark Sirkvenik. And um, yeah, he he loves to travel and he loves to cook and he loves to teach people about um, that way of eating. So we decided to do tours near the national parks in the U.S. where it's next to impossible Mm -hmm. to find uh, even healthy food. And um, we don't stay in hotels because we need access to a really, really well-equipped equipped kitchen. So we normally rent two or three houses, big houses that are, well, one big house, and then another one or two houses nearby within walking distance usually. And, um, all the meals are at the main house and, um, yeah, he's, he's cooking all the meals for six or seven days. Um, when we go out sightseeing, we bring really nice bagged lunches with us. We've been in national parks where people have like looked at our food and said, wow, (laughs) where did you get that? And they're like standing in this really long line for some disgusting junk food. Yeah. And the funny thing is that actually most of the people coming on those tours are not whole food plant-based. They're coming for the, because they love the destinations and they're, they're very happy to eat that way at home. But usually in a group of 12 people, there'll only be three or four that, that normally eat that way. So, um, those have been really popular. They've been selling out, like we do three a year and they've been selling out like a year ahead of time. Um, so this year we're going to, uh, Glacier National Park, um, we're having a uh, Yosemite and we are doing the first one abroad, but honestly, it will probably be the only one that we do abroad. Um, and that will be in the Lake District of England because, uh, you can't imagine how much food we have to buy for these tours. <laughs> I actually really want to see a photo. You need to take pictures. <laughs> Hey there, fantastic listeners. Let's hit pause on this episode for a thrilling announcement, a golden ticket to Globetrot with Veggies Abroad. Veggies Abroad isn't just your go-to for vegan guides and trip planning tips. It's your passport to extraordinary small group journeys. Carefully crafted by the ultimate veggie pusher and your favorite podcast host, me, Rebecca Gady Sawicki. I've spent countless hours researching the best vegan hotels, food, and experiences. And now I'm bringing those experiences directly to you. Join me and my newfound veggie pals on escapades to exciting and exotic destinations around the world. Whether it's trekking through the Thai jungle to witness elephants in their natural habitat or staying at a carbon neutral camp in Kenya during the Great Migration, our adventures are nothing short of spectacular. And guess what? Those aren't the only exciting trips awaiting you. So what are you waiting for? Cruise on over to veggiesabroad.com pronto. Well, how about after this episode is over? To explore our dazzling lineup of 2024 trips and secure your spot on your next vegan adventure today. Like usually... The food will, won't even all fit in the ref, in this enormous refrigerator. Like you know, he usually has to make another run like halfway through the trip, <laughs> and like an entire fourteen passenger van will be filled with wow. boxes of food. We always get there a couple days before the rest of the um, group arrives just to buy all the food and have the kitchen set up. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll never forget for one tour, we were buying 48 cans of beans. Holy (laughs) smokes. That is so many beans. I love this. This is like the perfect meme for people who are like, Vegans eat like bunnies. I'm like, no, we just filled up a 14 passenger van with food. Yep. We're not bunnies. Yeah. <laughs> and he makes like a lot of regional things, but veganized, you know. So we had a tour to Maine last year and we had like lobster rolls, but they the lobster was from artichoke hearts. Oh. And um, you know, 
some kind of crab thing. I, I don't remember what he used for that. Obviously, we're using mushrooms a lot for things. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so people have been loving the food. He gives um, cooking lessons and demonstrations to people that are interested. And um, But I have to say, it's a lot of work. It's, yeah. it's more work than a European tour because... Um, I even, I've been washing dishes on those tours for two to three hours a day. (laughs) Even some of the houses have two dishwashers and I am still washing dishes for two to three hours a day. I I mean, it's just unbelievable. And also (laughs) just the amount of dishes that he creates when he's cooking. So, um, yeah, they're a lot of work and, um, actually I'm letting one of my new assistants mostly handle those tours (laughs) from now on. (laughs) She's very young and energetic. I hope she likes dishes. (laughs) Yeah. And she, and she loves to hike and, um, I'm going to mostly stick with the European tours. So, um, those have, um, they're fun in in some ways. I mean, nobody else is is offering them, mm-hmm. so I feel like we have to keep offering them. But um, yeah, they definitely are a lot of work. But and we thought we would do one internationally every year, but you know, even in the U.S. to get all that food, we normally have to go to like four different stores. We're going to like Costco, to a restaurant supply store. Um, to a mainstream grocery store and then like maybe some specialty store or whole foods. And it's going to be hard to find all that in a foreign country. Yeah. You'd have to be a so, place that you were super, super familiar with. I, that that yeah. would be a challenge for sure. Yeah. And even that he's made a lot of improvements. I mean, the first time, the first tour we did, we did in Charleston, South Carolina. I was able to drive there. I was able to bring a lot of the kitchen equipment that we needed. Um, and, um, you know, that was like a good trial run. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then he got really smart. Now he has all these templates and he's mostly doing online ordering and curbside pickup. And he's only, um, he's only like picking out the produce by hand. Oh my gosh. Talk about a challenge that you didn't foresee. Like all of that sounds Uh, like a challenge that I would not have thought about with that. <laughs> yeah, I never thought I would be doing tours in the U.S., but when we just saw how popular they were... Um, I mean, that's an edge yeah, we realized- for sure, because you're right. You don't see that as often. I had someone on our Thailand trip ask me about that, and I was like, oh, well, I mean, we'll f- totally figure it out for you, but I think you're going to eat a lot of salad and fruit. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yep. there's a definite. I mean, if someone knows how to cook that way, yeah. the food is fabulous. Right. You know, way better than eating in a restaurant. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you if, ask, you're, if you're following yeah, that type of diet. For sure. If you ask me to do that for you, you're going to get oatmeal. I'm not sure yeah. what else you're going to get. <laughs> Salad. I, oh. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people, like, um, especially if they don't normally eat that way, not intentionally, but they end up losing like five pounds, um, on these trips oh, wow. because they're doing like even just some light hiking as well. And just from having the no oil, it makes a huge difference. And even though they can eat as much as they want, yeah. um, and he can completely customize, um, uh, requests. So not only can he do gluten-free without any problem, if somebody says, oh, I don't like spicy food, I don't like this particular vegetable, he makes oh a my point gosh. of leaving it wow. out for them. These are yeah, like very specialized tours. Oh my, holy smokes. That is a really yeah. neat experience. And then we've even had some people that are not only no oil, they don't eat any sugar or salt. Oh, <laughs> so honestly, we don't think the, well, he's not using refined sugar. I mean, he's using, uh, dates or date, sure. um, syrup or, but the no salt, uh, we don't, he really thinks you need a little bit of salt. So we're not doing, um, the whole group's food that way. But if one person says no salt, he can accommodate. Oh, wow. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's really, yeah. that's really something for sure. So when you're building out these tours, do you have one thing that you always try and add to every itinerary? I would say not really because it depends oh, on the location, if, you know, so we'll always like go to an animal sanctuary okay. if we can, but there's not always one in the area. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for these domestic ones, we pretty much are going to at least one national park, if not more. Yeah. So like we'll do one in 2025 in, um, New Mexico for the Albuquerque Balloon Festival. I've done that tour twice before as a hotel restaurant tour, but we'll do this one as a whole food plant-based tour. And, but even then there's national parks in the area. So, um, yeah, we're always definitely going to national parks, which is really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And on top of like creating these custom itineraries that are very unique, Each of your itineraries also supports a local charity too, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I mostly donating, well, we have a lot of, um, animal farm animal sanctuaries around where I live outside of Asheville, North Carolina. So a lot of those are my favorites and, you know, that's where I'm, um, donating to, but yeah, I've often thought about having a more structured, um, charitable giving program where maybe even my clients are choosing some of the sanctuaries. So, you know, we could say something like, oh, the first person that joins this tour could choose, you know, where we're going to make a donation. So I love that. That's a really, I think that could be fun. Yeah. The other thing I thought of is making it like focused on the area where you're traveling and choosing a couple charities and then having the group decide, I think that mm-hmm. that makes a really nice connection as well, but that's really awesome. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Yeah, that you bring that like you know social responsibility into each of your trips, which I think is really important, especially within the travel mm-hmm. world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a tour last year to uh, Zion and Bryce Canyon in Utah, and one of the best days we had. I mean, those two places are spectacular, but we went to best friends animal sanctuary in Kanab and we, we spent the whole day there and we volunteered there. And, um, it would be very possible to do a tour, uh, just like focusing on, on that place because they have their own motel now and, um, you can stay right there and it's pretty much a vegan organization. I mean, they have a, $5 $5 buffet lunch that's for their volunteers and for the public. Mm-hmm. And it's completely vegan. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a fabulous place. That's really cool. So you, I mean, you've been in the travel industry for quite a while and you've obviously seen a lot of changes as you kind of think back from, I don't know, maybe so 10 plus years ago, do you think that the demand for vegan and eco-friendly travel services opportunities is evolving and changing? Yeah, I think that um, there will always be more vegans every year. We're going to need more people to offer vegan tours. And um, I think it's interesting how some places become vegan-friendly, like almost overnight. And it was very strange too, how during COVID some cities, like in particular Lisbon, I would say Mm -hmm. they had so many places open during the pandemic. And it's kind of weird because where I live in Asheville, we lost places during the pandemic and we definitely had a better scene before COVID. It's, it's not as good now as it was. Um, So, yeah, I can think of a few places where there's just so many more vegan options now, even than when I started the business Mm -hmm. and, and also the vegan hotels and accommodations that are opening. Um, it's just fabulous. And yeah, I mean, hopefully they'll be able to do really well and, and stay open. Unfortunately, sometimes the places are too small uh, to bring a group there. Yeah. Um, 
or they're not in a very convenient location. Um, they're oftentimes, you know, outside of cities. Um, but you know, little by little it's changing. Even now there, you can find accommodations right in the center of some cities or at least bed and breakfast. So, uh, I have one interesting story. So there's a German hotel chain that I use that I like to use throughout Europe and I, I like to promote them. So I'll, I'll yeah, tell you it? the name of it. It's called Motel One, oh, which is yeah. a very I've funny name. stayed in name. one in Switzerland. Uh-huh. So when I first brought a group there to Scotland, we stayed there in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And that, I think, was in... Well, it was before the pandemic, so it was probably in 2019. And I was bringing like 12 people for an entire week, and I asked them if they could provide some vegan yogurt. Yeah. And they said no. Oh. And I said, well, if I buy it, can you store it in your refrigerator? Well, I uh, probably not. I mean, it's going to take up too much room and da-da-da-da-da. So we just went there and made do. I mean, they they t- they promote themselves as having an organic local breakfast. So you know, it was okay what we had. They always did have plant milk, so that was fine. Yeah. We went back after the pandemic to the same hotel uh, in Edinburgh. And there on the buffet, they had homemade vegan yogurt, (laughs) a huge bowl of it, Violife slices, more types of plant milk, hummus that was labeled vegan. Yeah. And that was just- Oh my gosh. They're doing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it, it was thrilling to see that. I felt like when we stayed there, I always kind of needed to supplement from another place, but we don't need to do it anymore. It's, it's really good. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you think that that's a trend that travelers might see more of is that places are becoming more friendly that wouldn't necessarily have been friendly before or have felt that they needed to be friendly? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, yeah, I'm even amazed sometimes when when it's not in a city and mm-hmm. and you just see these options, um, and also uh, some of the airlines. You know, we've been hearing about really have a lot of options now. Today, I just I wasn't aware of this. Um, I saw that Virgin Atlantic has oat milk. Um, on every flight, except for some reason on flights that go to Israel. I didn't understand that. That's strange. Then they only have uh, soy milk. Hmm. It's it specifically said that on the website. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's some airlines that still have a ways to go. And, you know, one thing I saw lately was not only do they not have many options, but I've actually seen um, mistakes so oh, no. like I, I, I flew to Europe two of the times I flew last year, uh, and the breakfast, first of all, it was so strange. They actually gave a cookie for breakfast <laughs> and it was this, um, this American brand grandma's cookies. For breakfast. And I'm like, well, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. And then I look at the label and it said right on it contains milk. What the heck? What airline were you flying? Yeah, so that was American, I think. Oh, I've heard a lot of people complain about American. I haven't been on an American flight in ages. That's unfortunately the one that, um, yeah, is pretty much my home base. And I've also now one very disturbing thing was that, I mean, I had been ordering vegetarian meals for 38 years and never had an issue except one time on an Air France flight, they didn't have the meal. Since COVID, um, I would say half my vegan meals, they have not had. No way. And I wonder I if have it's never because of demand? forgotten to order. That's I, nuts. You know, 
they'll try to blame it. They'll try to blame it on me and say that I forgot to order. And I'll say, no. Hmm. Well, I had the meal going to Europe. Yeah. So it was in my record. Yeah. But you don't have it coming home. Yeah. Or they'll have it for dinner, but there'll be nothing for breakfast. Interesting. And even one time, so the first tour I did after COVID um, in the fall of 21, when the flights were very limited and the only flight they had going from the U.S. to Italy was leaving from Dallas. And so there were three of us uh, on my tour that were on that same flight. We had all ordered vegan meals. None of us got them. (sighs) But other people on the flight got them. So so they had them. And I don't know if they were given to them by mistake, but it was really weird that none of ours showed up. So, or even things like I've had a couple traveling together and I made their flight arrangements and I ordered vegan meals for both of them and only one of them got them. Wow, that's yeah. So that's been troubling. Yeah. It's almost all been on American. <laughs> and I just feel like I always have to bring my own snacks now, um, especially for the long flights. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I always try and bring stuff with me too, but sometimes I forget. And I've only had it one time where they were like, oh, shoot, we don't have a meal for you. And I actually, it could have been my mistake. This is ages ago. Um, uh-huh. But since... I'd say most of them have been pretty good. There's only been like a few where I'm trying to think maybe there wasn't an option, just period. There was like nothing. Um, but that's like, it's been few and far between. I feel like things well, that's are good. definitely getting better, but I also have the luxury of flying Delta because we're a Delta hub in Detroit. So I don't like run into some of the other issues that people complain about. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Yeah. Good to know. I mean, I feel like I might start taking them more often from now because like from where I am, I can either fly to Charlotte to get an international flight or to Atlanta. And, uh, from Charlotte, it would be American, but from Atlanta, Delta is definitely the popular one. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, so far, so good. I feel like I should knock on wood after saying that good. out loud. <laughs> so what are you working on next? Are there new things that listeners should look out for are coming out from you or any other exciting news? Yeah, well, my head is totally in 2025 mm-hmm. right now, um, but I, w- I think I'm currently planning like 25 tours. So I have all the ones for this year, which... I'm now doing the detailed planning for and the detail, well, not really the planning, the detailed reservations, I would say. But then, um, since a couple weeks ago, I've been planning the 2025 schedule. So that's more the long range, um, stuff. And, um, we hope to have a tour, um, in 2025 to New Zealand. Oh, how cool. Um, yeah, I have a good contact there. So I, I hope it will happen and that it won't be too expensive. Um, we'll have to see. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I, I, I mentioned that uh, for almost 20 years, I worked for the government of Singapore and, uh, I absolutely love it there. And I've been so excited to bring a tour there. So that will finally happen in 2025. Um, and it's a super vegan friendly place and very interesting place. Um, and, um, yeah. And then, uh, we'll have some new tours in Europe because I have, um, some people now that are not just helping me lead the tours, but they're also interesting, interested in help planning tours because I was really at my, I couldn't handle anymore. You know, and one of my assistants said, well, what if I do all the planning? And I was like, yeah, yeah that, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, you can pretty much, and in fact, she's, she's flying in, um, this week and we will have a planning session over the weekend. Um, to decide what we should add to the schedule. So, oh my God, that's um, amazing. I cannot yeah, imagine. Yeah, so that's why. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. 
I, I was just going to say, that's why I, I'm able to have more than 10 tours a year yeah. now, because, you know, I have these, um, these great, competent, enthusiastic women helping. Yeah, so. absolutely. I can only imagine what a relief that is. And just like the awesome feeling to have someone else to, you know, shoot ideas off of with and to have support with that's <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not tired of traveling, but last year, I think I was between the tours and my personal trips. I think I was away for four months, which is it's way time, yeah. too, it's too much for me. Um, and so I'm trying to cut that down every year. Mm -hmm. And luckily my two assistants would like to go on as many tours as I will give them. So, um, I, I hope, you know, they're younger than me and I, I, they have a lot more energy. So I hope they'll still feel that way for a while. And, um, really my goal is to, uh, be away, uh, just do one or two tours a year that I'm actually doing or, um, not be away for more than a month. So, um, yeah, probably in 2026, it'll look like that. Yeah. That's, so, um, that'll be a nice place of balance. And I think that's always a funny thing to talk about with people because I think they think naturally because we work in travel that of course, like you just want to live out of a suitcase and never be home. But after a while, like you can only do that for so long, like having <laughs> steady space and time zone and internet connection there's something to be said for that. Yeah. And it's, it's hard when you have pets at home yes. and, uh, you know, disrupting them, even if you have good pet sitters, it's, it's still something you really have to think about, especially as the pets are getting older. And, um, yeah, I mean, there, where I live, there's a lot of vegan events going on and I hate to, uh, there's just things that I invariably miss because I'm always leading a tour and, um, yeah, I just want to be able to stay home more for things like that. Yeah. Right. Plus when you're away so much leading tours, it's really hard to do research for new places. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. It's really hard to get other work done. That is for sure. I was yep. just talking about something, um, that the, the Instagrammers of the world and some of the others who like to make uh, working from a beach or working from, I don't know, a patio somewhere, like looks like such a lush life, but it's absolute total garbage. That's not how it really yeah. is. You don't get serious <laughs> yeah. amount of work done that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, when it was just me, I mean, I would be leading a tour and still doing all the back office admin stuff. Yeah. And, um, that's really hard as well. So at least now I, I do have people I could count on in an emergency. Right. Um, but yeah. And little by little, I'll, I'll show them how to do more of the admin things. So progress. You got to love it. That's great. Yeah. You're taking over. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> My last question, if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would it be and why? Um, years ago, some friends of mine that are like the most traveled people I know, uh, I saw photos of theirs from Tasmania and, um, they were absolutely amazing. So I don't know what the vegan scene is like there, but, um, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know when I'll ever get there, but it, it moved to the top of my list. I mean, it was never somewhere I ever thought about going. Um, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm still just enamored of Europe for the most part. Um, and, and even though I've seen a lot of it, I'm, definitely interested in exploring more of the lesser known cities. I'm, I'm really not into the blockbuster cities anymore, but, um, the lesser ones and, and a lot of them have really good vegan scenes. Yeah. So it's always really nice to wander down some of the streets and some of the places and like find signs that say vegan options or vegan this. Yep. I was in Switzerland, I think it was. And I actually, just took pictures of all the signs that I would see because it was just like one yep. after the other, after the other. I was like, this yeah. is amazing. It's fabulous. Yep. And I'm really looking forward to when the U S becomes like that. There always seems to be, you know, a lag time of a few years or so, but I think it'll happen eventually. I mean, I feel like 
it's pretty easy in European airports and train stations to find vegan food, mm-hmm. but I don't feel like it's like that in the U.S. at all. Yeah, depending on definitely the airport, airports are just mm-hmm. a pain in the neck for yeah, <laughs> sure yeah. in general. They're really the worst. Yeah, and and lately I'm having I'm making myself have very long layovers because I'm just worried about something going wrong, you know? So it's like, yes, think the thought of spending like eight hours in an airport oh and gosh. having to plan ahead for the food and stuff like that. And, and even now, like I have access, you know, to all the fabulous lounges, but they're not that vegan friendly, really. Yeah. There's very little. So it's definitely hit or miss. Like sometimes you'll get one, you'll be yeah. like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then other times you're like, oh my God, this is crap. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've, I've also found that like, um, some cities that are very vegan friendly, the airports are awful. Like JFK, for instance. J- I, yes. Um, that is always at the top of my list. JFK is terrible. I hate getting stuck yep. there and I'm, if I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes I really will route myself through places like Boston or Philadelphia where the well, the airports aren't bad, and also those airports are not very far from the city. Mm-hmm. So you can just, if you have a long layover, yeah, you can you just can take um, a train or the subway, and and those Philly especially is super vegan friendly. So yeah, that's a really good idea if you've got a long layover to try and pick a city like that for sure. Yep. Yeah. I have to say though, in Philly, I was so disappointed. They used to have a Chipotle there, which was fabulous. And then what did it turn into? A Chick-fil-A. No! (laughs) (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I think that's a very sad note to end on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) Well, you did leave us with a good tip of making your layover longer in cities that are easier to get two vegan restaurants. Yeah. So we'll just keep that at the top of our mind. Okay. Our mind. <laughs> it has been so nice to chat with you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk about what you've been working on at Veg Johnson, Veg Johnson Journeys and how you got started. So thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. I wish you so much success with this podcast. I'm really looking forward to listening to all the episodes. Oh, I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. If you'd also like to learn more about upcoming Veggies Abroad tours or get additional travel help, visit veggiesabroad.com and also join our newsletter. It's the best way to stay up to date with loads of new content, like where to find gorgeous vegan hotels, what to eat in cities around the world, trip planning tips, and so much more. Well, that's all I've got for now. Until next time.